name is Karen Dufek, and I'm a curator of contemporary visual arts in Pacific Northwest at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. I've been here for what seems to be forever, but it's been a fantastic um, privilege to work here for since about two, year 2000 um, in a curatorial position. Over that time period, so much has happened within the field of museums, of Indigenous art, and the relationships between the two. So it's been an exciting time to kind of work with Indigenous community members and to work toward changing the institution and trying to build knowledge about the collections, trying to activate those collections within communities um, and you know, bring some life to them keep on learning, learning, learning. It's a constant learning process. And um, so, yeah, and I've lived in Vancouver for my life, my whole life, <laughs> and studied here at UBC. So I'm a BCer through and through. Um, and I continue to be really energized and engaged by the work that we do here, um, the challenges of the work and the people that we meet. Uh, especially the Indigenous community members and artists that we get to work with. Yeah. So this hat that um, I chose here is a contemporary Haida artwork. It's from 2014 and it was recently donated to the museum as part of a collection from a woman in Montreal named Elspeth McConnell who commissioned this hat for herself from this master Haida weaver, Isabel Rorick, who is an absolute master at working with spruce root uh, basketry. And it was painted by her cousin, Robert Davidson, also a very leading contemporary Haida artist. They combined forces to make a hat for this elderly Montreal lady who wanted to actually wear it in her apartment. And she was a big collector of North Coast art, historical and contemporary. and. Um, and really enjoyed having her collection around her. She enjoyed supporting the work of contemporary living younger generations of North West Coast artists and so she was able, she had the means to uh, do these major commissions and then uh, on her uh, passing she bequeathed this collection to the Museum of Anthropology. So the work of the collection is ongoing because um, there are so many artists who want to come and look at the, especially the historical work from her collection. But because she was so such a force in nurturing and supporting contemporary artists, there's a lot of um, interest also in the, in the contemporary works that she has now added to our collection and really built our collection in important ways. So one of the things that I've always wished that we'd have in our collection is more of the work of Isabel Rorick. Um, she, is um, from a line of descent of very masterful weavers, Haida weavers. Um, she had to learn, though, a lot from museum collections because when she wanted to learn spruce root weaving, there was a certain amount that she could learn from her grandmother and from other relatives. But she also spent a lot of time going to museum collections in British Columbia here and other parts of North America to kind of visually unravel the basketry that she saw there from her nation, the Haida nation. Um, she was really interested in the work of Isabella Eden Shaw, who's one of the few named basket makers of the past. So, Haida, so basket makers' names were often not recorded by collectors. It was seen as kind of a craft that was anonymous. And so it remains a challenge for researchers and artists today to put names to some of these baskets of the past by studying the style. And when you, when you, if this was an old piece and we were looking at it to try to identify it, we would look at the very particular weave patterns, very subtle. They're kind of hidden in a sense by the painting, but you can see the specific patterns that are the style now of Isabel Rorick and that she has um, created herself being inspired by historical pieces. We would look at the weave of this part of the hat, which
which is different. We would look at the top of the hat and if it's painted or marked or some way. Um, we'd look to see if there is painting on it and who might have done that. We'd look at the inside of the hat, the way the edges are done, the way the braid is done near the join. So there's all of these kind of very specific, very subtle things that are of interest to young generations like Isabel Rorick who have been relearning this art form and you know, the people who really study this and are trying to put names to the old pieces. Um, so this is woven out of spruce root and that alone is an amazing thing when you think of the labor and the knowledge. Where do you find spruce roots and how do you get them on, out of the ground and once you get them out of the ground what do you do with them? Like all of this and all of these are things that Isabel had to learn from her elders, um, her mother as well. Um, and it's very, it connects you very much to, to the landscape, right? So in Haida Gwaii, there are specific places where there are fantastic, huge spruce, spruce trees growing and kind of mossy, thick, mossy um, undergrowth. And so I have myself never pulled a spruce root, but I've seen uh, films of it and they go on for a long way. So you really have to track this route you have to go up and down and crawl over logs and stumps and etc cetera, etc cetera, trying to follow this route and pu and pull it out of the ground and keep it as long as you can and you know you want a certain diameter of it and strength and not too gnarly and that sort of thing um, so that there's that entire process and of course knowing when in the year do you do this kind of work you can't go and pull spruce roots any old time. It has to be at the right time of year. So there's a, a, an entire science and uh, pass down knowledge and way of understanding your landscape and honoring the ways in which your people have, um, you know, pulled these things out of the earth literally to use for their artworks. Um, and then and the whole kind of approach to doing it, like a frame of mind to doing it that is respectful and that is proper. So all of that goes into, when you look at a piece like this, a contemporary hat that we might call art, it's more, it's so much more than the physical object that we see in front of us, even in a contemporary work because all of those things go into it, that history, that knowledge, the learning, the connection. So once you get your roots, then you need to process them, roast them and skin them, split them, split them, split them super fine. And then you end up with different types of very fine roots. And some of them that are suitable for different parts of the basket or different parts of the hat. Some of them have a rounded edge to them and others are flat and so the weaver knows what to do with all of these specific things. And the Haida wove in a kind of unique way because the hat like this started at the top. So you would often have a support, like a stand with a flat disc on top that you would start from and you weave down the hat. Some weavers today use a mold that supports the whole thing. And I believe that Isabel prefers not to use one. Um, normally when you make a basket, like a container basket, in many cultures, you begin at the base and you work your way up the basket. So in a sense, this is the opposite direction that they're working in. There's a whole mathematics as well to making a hat like this because you're beginning with the diameter like this, and then you're ending with the diameter like that. And so you have to insert your strands as you go so that you get this perfect flare. And then not only getting the flare, but you have to get, in this case, these diamond shapes perfectly figured out so that you're not ending up with just half a diamond shape somewhere. So the mathematics, of the whole thing is quite extraordinary and in fact in 
in um, indigenous uh, programs now where the vocabulary of science is used to, to speak about indigenous knowledge, you know, that it's not lore, it's not just, you know, stories. There's an actual science and, you know, this deep understanding to the land and the fruits of the land and the relationship to the land that is embodied in these kinds of things. So uh, Isabel Rourke, I wish I remembered now how many of these hats she's made in her career so far, but it's a lot. Um, she makes them for Ida people and she makes them for sale to collectors like Elspeth McConnell. Um, the, the making of these things for collectors helps to support that other work for, cult, for the cultural setting. So there's a good symbiosis between the two. Um, and she certainly doesn't differentiate in terms of the quality of her work because she's always um, aiming for the highest quality that she can do. Always on her baskets and her hats, she puts her signature, which again is very subtle. It's not an I and an O, it's, a, it's these three rings that are raised in the basket tree weave on the top of the hat which represent her three children. And painted on this hat is a, what's called a flying frog. The hat is called flying frog and it was made in 2014. Um, and that is the work purely of Robert Davidson. So I had always believed maybe that the two would work together when they plan something like this, but she says, no, I just hand the hat over and I've done my work. And so she doesn't work with him then to decide what should this design be, how should it be. So I don't know if maybe the collector asked for a flying frog or <laughs> if she allowed the artist just to do what he wanted. But he, you know, you see the frog face at the front and then it's split in half and goes around the sides of the hat so that we see the frog's feet at the back. And we see these things that look like fins coming out of the side, but maybe they're feathers like wings or something. And then we see this other something up there that has a face and might be the spirit of the frog or something like that, I don't know. Um, so when I see something like this um, that one might classify right away as traditional Northwest Coast art, traditional Haida art or something like that, not necessarily contemporary art. I will always argue that that division doesn't make any sense for this type of work because there's, um, although it's, it's, it follows a model of historical Haida basketry hats and it absolutely tries to emulate that form standard. Um, it's like a, a part of a, such an important resurgence, Haida resurgence. It's such a part of a contemporary expression of being Haida against all of the odds of everything that has come the way of the Haida in terms of assimilation and governmental oppression and Indian Act and residential schools and all of those things that have had such a massive, massive impact in the colonial history and up to the present day for the Haida people, that younger generations have, you know, revitalized this kind of thing. To me, is a fully contemporary expression. It's a fully contemporary thing to do because they're expressing themselves as Haida people today, as contemporary Haida people that have this absolute rootedness in their territory, this connection to their lands and their genealogies and their families. Um, all of those things that are embodied within what you just could call a basketry hat. <laughs> this is a wonderful brogue contemporary piece by the Simsian weaver William White. And he did this in 2004. Um, and it <coughs> is called, a, it's wi widely known as a chill cat robe, this type of a robe that is woven in this way. 
Um, although in the Tsimsian language, it's called Gwishalayet, which means the spirit wraps around you. This is a robe that would be worn by a dancer within a ceremonial context like the potlatch, and is also a chiefly robe worn by high-ranking people who have the right to do so. Um, the patterns on them are sometimes identified by various forms like whales or ravens or something like that. This is called the, uh, I, th I think, raven and frog robe. But it's more the very unique way in which these things are woven, um, not on a loom, but with the hanging warp threads down and it's twined um, in a very special way, um, woven in sections. There's complete circles, there's curves, there's all of these techniques that are very distinctive to what we now know as Chilkat weaving. There's many historical examples in museum collections. And they were woven in the northern um, part of the northwest coast primarily, the Tsimsian, Mishka, Haida, Tlingit, um, very distinctive to those people. And there are new generations of weavers now, um, including William White, who have brought to life again this important art form and have been working to create them for chiefly regalia and um, to develop other kinds of objects from this weaving technique that um, can be sold to art collectors and become part of the support of the work that they do. So this particular weaving um, it was a commission from the Museum of Anthropology and Willie White came to the museum to um, be an artist in residence and to work on this robe um, within the pul public realm so that people could watch him do it and then he completed it back home in Prince Rupert afterwards. And he only ever intended it as a museum piece. It was a child size robe, smaller size. Um, and he thought it would just be a display piece forever. But what happened was that um, because William is so involved within potlatch ceremony, at some point he said, do you think you could borrow that weaving and use it in a potlatch? And that started quite a journey for this piece. It has become one of the most activated pieces within the museum collection. And I've had the thrill of bringing it up to numerous potlatches with our conservator, Heidi Sferinga. And um, it is worn primarily by young people, children usually because of the size of the robe, but not always. It's been worn by women and younger adults as well. And in some of the potlatches we've been at, it's basically on the floor, as we would call it. In other words, being danced throughout the entire full day and night, if not two days and nights of the potlatch ceremony, uh, mainly in Alert Bay where we've taken it to potlatches where William White has connections and is very involved. So to see this piece lying here on the table flat like this is a pretty different experience than to see somebody wearing it and as the since a name for it, you know, the spirit wraps around you to see that kind of action. The whole thing is designed to be used and to um, have a certain kind of emotion to it. This long fringe is a very important part of the Chilkat robe and it's given an added sort of weight because there is cedar bark um, spun into the warp threads. And so that's the brown parts that you can see mixed in with the wool. In this case, this is the wool used in this robe is sheep's wool. But in the old blankets, it would have been mountain goat wool most often, which itself carries a lot of um, power and importance, spiritual aspects to it. Um, and then Willie White later added a fringe onto the sides because once it was being worn it needed to have that to look more complete. He has also, because it was being worn, had to alter the way in which it ties onto the person and buttons and ties around the neck to make it more functional. 
at the museum here we have a policy of preserving the life of an object as opposed to only preserving the physical aspect of an object. So to send a piece like this out into ceremony to make sure that it has this life that brings it into motion, that brings it into connection with families and with uh, community and with the purpose that these kinds of things are actually made for, um, means that it sometimes has a physical effect on the piece. And in this case, the, the pull of the original tie that was on the neck didn't really work and it was starting to kind of um, warp the top of the weaving. So um, William came to the museum and together with Heidi they talked about what could be done to support it better for the purpose of use. So I think that's fantastic for a museum piece, especially something created, funded by the Canada Council as a contemporary art kind of project, <laughs> that it um, ends up becoming such an important part of ceremonial life. So it's, it has this, this, this large um, life, right? It's, it's great having it in the museum and people love to see it. It's such a beautifully made uh, contemporary interpretation, manifestation of the Gushalayak. And then it has this life outside the walls of the museum within community. Um, and both of these things come together and they enrich this piece and they enrich all of us who get to look at it and see it in motion. Um, it's quite um, fun to somehow, to sometimes um, go against what one might think are standard museum practices <coughs> and not only bring the piece up to be used into ceremony but to bring, to deliver it to the kitchen of one of the family members who's going to use it <laughs> the night before the ceremony. The kitchen where dinner's being cooked and people are making gifts to be given away at the potlatch and people are coming in and out and things are being planned and decisions made about the potlatch and all of the regalia is laid out on the living room furniture and with great pride and the love and the care of that regalia is obvious. Um, these are precious things. They take months and months and months, if not years to make. Again, all of the preparation of the materials before you even begin weaving, let alone the weaving. So these things are very, very treasured within communities today, whether these pieces are old or new. And um, it's kind of exciting to sometimes let go that museum control and know that um, there's a that, that, that there's an appreciation for the thing for the use of it and, and the care for it that has been evidenced for generations and generations within the community for precious things like this so Henry Speck Uji Stalis one of my absolute favorites he was um, an artist, Kwakwakwak artist, Kalu, from Kaluguis on Turner Island, Tlaubitsis tribe. He was born in 1908 and died in 1971. And um, he was a person who was fully, fully a leader and important person in his community, so dedicated to ceremony and learning and teaching within his community during the whole time when the potlatch ceremony was against the law and it was banned by the Canadian government until 1951. And so through much of his life, um, the main, the central ceremony of the Kwakwakiwak people was against the law. But he was fully involved in it through that time and um, was initiated into the ceremony as a Hamatsa dancer at the age of 12 and um, spent a, just a few years at Indian Residential School in Alert Bay and ultimately um, took on a hereditary chieftainship of his community and he was a real modernizer in his community. He um, really got stuff done 
like in his um, community of Kalu, Greece, he put in a power plant and a built a, you know, built the infrastructure of the community, electricity, all that kind of stuff, trying to modernize the infrastructure of the community. He was a um, devout Christian. He was a member of the church and, and um, it was very important to his life. And at the same time, was committed to making sure that the ceremonies of the Kwakwakiwak would not disappear because of that potlatch ban and all the other forces that were mitigating against it. Um, and he, in the 1950s, became all of a sudden well known publicly because he was doing these paintings on the impetus of a Hungarian art dealer who came to Vancouver and opened an antique shop. And this Hungarian guy, he kind of was lamenting about the state of native art at that time in the province. And he thought it was dying out and he wanted to help to stimulate good quality native art, as he kind of put it. And so he actually headed out to Vancouver Island with paper and paints and handed them out to indigenous people and said, if you make a painting, I'll buy it off you. And so that's actually what happened. We have quite a collection of them here at the museum and there's a big collection at the Glenbow Museum in Calgary and then many families have them and private collectors have them. Um, and so for a very short period, when this dealer Eula Meyer discovered, as he said, Henry Speck, who of course existed long before he was discovered. Um, he organized an, a show of Henry Speck's paintings downtown Vancouver in the New Design Gallery, which was a very edgy art space in Vancouver. And so there was this show there in 1964, I guess it was. Um, where they made prints out of some of the paintings that Henry Speck made, and they made a big hoopla about it. And it got a lot of attention in the press. Um, people at that time, late 50s, early 60s, the general public were not that familiar with indigenous art. It wasn't really a thing as it is now. It wasn't much of a market. Um, the museums were beginning to pay more attention to it and to try to create better public understanding of Northwest Coast art. But it was really kind of beginning at the time. The wider public had pretty stereotypical notions of what native art constituted and whether, you know, this kind of general belief that it was all over at that point. And it was so interesting because Henry Speck's paintings um, in themselves, you could almost call modernist works. He was doing these very new representations of his culture. He was representing, for example, in this painting of this wasp dance, these two dancers wearing wasp masks. He's actually representing a dancer as opposed to carving and painting a mask that would be worn by a dancer. So that would be the traditional thing to do is you'd make the mask or you'd dance the dance. He's making a picture of somebody wearing the mask and dancing the dance. Um, and that in itself had not been done very much. So there were a few people who were painting scenes and things like that. Mungo Martin had done something like that. But Henry Speck, he painted probably at least 400 paintings on paper in a very short period of time. Um, at the impetus of that dealer. <clears throat> and here at the museum, we have a few of them, luckily. Um, I was able with Marcia Crosby to do an exhibition of his work downtown a few years ago at our satellite gallery space. And um, it was really kind of exciting to learn more about Henry Speck and to connect with his family and learn from them about him. Um, he's such a treasured person, even though he died <clears throat> in 1971, way too young and just kind of before the real um, kind of um, 
public growth of, un of knowledge and interest in native art started. Um, he, you know, he died, I think he was only 60 something. Um, he is remembered by everybody still and so fondly. Galidi, he's called by the Kwakwaka'wakw people. Uji Stalas was his chief's name. Um, as such a loving person and so, as I said before, so committed to um, making sure that he was passing on his knowledge about ceremony and all of these systems that, you know, that ceremony was really tied to governance and family and genealogy and the whole way of being of the community, even though he was Christian, even though they were living in this completely modern way, you know, even though he was very involved in the fisheries organization, trying to fight for better rights for indigenous fishermen. He too was a fisherman. All of these things that constituted a, a very modern lifestyle, of course, and and having to grapple with all of the prejudice and oppression of indigenous people that was absolutely prevalent during his lifetime. He created these paintings that were really kind of joyful and imaginative. The artists of today who still very much admire his work and in fact you know you look at some of his paintings and you see the beginnings of animation for example the work that young indigenous animators are doing now um, the way he represented the figure in action all of this kind of brush stroke work that he did to create feathering to create some sort of depth um, texturing um, the, the motion of these figures dancing in relation to each other um, his paintings varied quite a bit so this is one of the more dynamic ones I would say but one of the things that I learned from Kwakwakluak community members who we talked to about Henry Speck's work was how they could see that every detail that he put into his work was accurate in terms of representing his knowledge so when he put a certain mask with a certain kind kind of neck ring maybe in some of his other paintings or a certain button blanket with a crest motif on it with a certain headdress he wasn't just randomly putting things together for the sake of design or for the sake of creating a more interesting visual composition he was doing things that nowadays can actually be read as this goes with this this is the proper way in which this particular regalia is worn so that was kind of another aspect that's interesting when his show opened at the new design gallery the kinds of things that were said about the work in the press were um, um, chief gives a tootle for arts of the kwakiutl and things like that like these kind of paternalistic insulting kind of derogatory meant to be positive in a sense <laughs> reviews of the work that um, showed kind of a lack of understanding of what he was doing these were hard to classify because they didn't fit into the kinds of traditional art forms that people might have been familiar with or that they thought they were familiar with um, they were seen as kind of traditional and modern at the same time. There was a really interesting CBC radio uh, review of that exhibition done by Bill Reed, the famous Haida artist who was a CBC announcer still at that time. And he was very troubled by these paintings of Henry Specks because he didn't really, he thought that they looked trapped. He called them like trapped beasts trapped within their frames and that they needed to be kind of on the wall of, of a big ceremonial house. He somehow felt conflicted about whether it was a kind of misplaced indigeneity or whether it was a misplaced modernity or how the two fit together. They seemed to raise questions in people's minds about what is authentic native art, um, when does it stop being native art, all that kind of thing. And I don't think any of those things troubled Henry Speck from what I can tell from what he, when he was interviewed, um, some of his statements that are out there. 
he was painting things that <clears throat> gave him joy to paint and he was painting as much for his community as he was for any unknown buyer I would say he was representing things that were completely meaningful still to him and his community members even though they likely would not be very well understood by the non-native public who was viewing them and maybe buying prints of them kind of an interesting dilemma but it's probably still true for many native artists today who um, whose work whether it's a mask or a print or some sort of representation of their <coughs> um, heritage is not understood fully by the non-native consumer often and in a way some some see that as okay because it protects that knowledge it's not necessarily meant to go away go out there into the wider world so there these are all the things I see when I see a Henry Speck painting um, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done on people of his era these artists who were persevering through a time of oppression and carrying on their culture against all the odds it was against the law and um, and yet they did it and they did it with this flamboyance and um, passion and commitment to their communities their families I like how he or maybe it wasn't him I don't know who wrote in ballpoint pen you know it's like that ethnographic information in a sense wasp dance hamasalatlamin I think it might be pronounced like that. And in those days, he wrote his name Uzi Stalas like that. And nowadays, we spell it a little bit differently. Chief Henry Speck. So there's these different kind of pens and styles of writing. So I think that <laughs> collectors or others might have written on here. <clears throat> um, but he signed it himself. Yeah. And it's, I love showing these paintings to younger artists who have come in and um, some of them doing animation. Um, and they're just totally turned on by Henry Speck's paintings <laughs> um, because they're so dynamic already that he was doing at, his, at that time. Really innovative for um, what he had seen himself as an artist, Kwakwaka'wakw artist. So we were really lucky um, a few years ago when we had some money here at the museum for special purchases of um, artworks. And from the Northwest Coast, we um, could make proposals for pieces that we thought would be of interest that would really add something to the museum's collection, um, mainly by contemporary workers. So. This was something that I had hoped that we could get something from this wonderful artist whose um, inherited name now is Ha Yops, and he's, his English name is Ron Hamilton. And he's a Nuchanoth um, historian and ceremonialist, a very knowledgeable person, doesn't call himself an artist, although he works very much within art media, like drawing. Um, he is a singer potlatch leader, um, curator, writer, poet, and so on. He's a maker of things. And one of the things that he has done in his art practice, if I can call it that, um, and not done for any sort of market or for institutions or anything, but rather as almost ephemera that he gives to people that he meets or that are friends of his, are little drawings on pieces of paper that could be like a napkin in a restaurant or a scrap of paper, or in this case, bookmarks from bookstores in BC. So when I contacted him to ask if he had something, some sort of aspect of his drawing that we could perhaps buy from him for the museum's collection, he proposed some of the bookmarks that he's been drawing on for years. So this. We have maybe about over 60, I guess, 
that we got from him at this time, and they ranged from the late 1960s to about 2015. And they include um, everything from where he's actually drawn on a bookmark um, from a store. Um, so he's collected various bookmarks. This is from a store in Port Alberni, and um, as, as a piece of paper that he's drawing on, and sometimes he's just cutting out a piece of paper. In this case here, he's got a scrap of paper that might be um, left over from a print or drawing that he's done, or just some sort of piece of paper. And he's drawn on them, um, primarily these images of often things to do with whaling. So the New Channel people that he's from were the whalers of the Northwest Coast. They were the people who went out into the Pacific Ocean, sometimes for two weeks at a time in their huge canoes um, to catch the whales. Um, and so it's a, the whaling is just this absolutely central aspect of New Channel philosophy. Their whole relationship to their world is tied up in many, many different beliefs and ideas and behaviors to do with whaling. So he has, so Ron, Ron has put these images of things to do with whaling largely onto a bookmark very deliberately because he's kind of putting two kinds of knowledge systems together. He's using this marker of Western knowledge, text, you know, things written down, preserved. And on the back of it, he's inscribed it in a sense with um, new channel of knowledge, um, with the beliefs that connect his people to their very specific lands, to this place, to time, time immemorial up to the present day. And he's done it in a way that um, doesn't really fit the boxes of what we might call Northwest Coast art. So those are the kinds of things that really interested me in thinking about how could we at the Museum of Anthropology expand our collection in a meaningful way when we have this special opportunity to do that um, in a way that um, looked at work that was being done by contemporary artists that was um, taking different kinds of formats than we might predict in, are included within Northwest Coast art or that speak specifically to their relationship to, or the artist's relationship to um, museums, to the way in which knowledge is preserved within museums and books, within Western kinds of formats. And is addressing that kind of relationship and some of the tensions about that relationship through their work. Um, so in, the, the, so the, these, think these, these bookmarks really vary the drawings that he's done. I mean, they're, with Ron Hamilton, he's uh, pretty amazing with his pencil. And he's done a variety of mediums from felt pen to pencil crayon, pen and ink and pencil. And, you know, in this one, for example, we can see what well, is probably, probably a Thunderbird figure um, these figures, human figures, human-like figures that look like the ones you might see in some of the petroglyphs in New Channel landscapes, the rock carvings. Um, you see a being, a supernatural being, overlooking the mountains and the ocean. And you often see a lot of, lot of skulls in these works, which I believe reference the whaler skulls, the the drowned whalers. You see in this one all these various acc accoutrements of whaling, the inflated seal skin buoy, the ropes, the big ropes that were used to harpoon the whale and attach the buoy to the whale so that it would slow the whale down. Um, different representations of what look like dorsal fins of the whale, the harpoon head, attached to the sinewed rope, the whale head, and skulls, skulls, skulls. 
They're fascinating, these bookmarks. It's great to look at these again. They're just in the process right now of being catalogued in the museum. And um, I see that they're being gradually numbered, museum numbers putting up, put on them. Another layer of classification. <laughs> and they sometimes have some writing on them, bits of stories, sometimes in English, sometimes in the Duchamel's language. This looks like a lightning serpent, the attendant of the great Thunderbird, the greatest whaler of all time. Whaling has been a the greatest whaler, of, whaler all time. of all time, the Thunderbird. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, just that the Thunderbird, this, you know, what we what we would call in English a supernatural being. Um, the, this huge bird in the sky that created the thunder and that was able to you know, dive down from the heavens to the ocean and grab a whale in its talons and bring it up again to, the, to its sky world. So the thunderbird is represented a lot in New Channel's art, a very powerful being. And the thunderbird had these helpers that were sometimes called dogs or lightning serpents or serpents. So Ron is representing various serpents in some of these bookmarks. This one done in pencil crayon. Some of them are signed, not all of them are. So I love the variety and this kind of, these funny bookmarks these pages cleaning these books <laughs> from Powell River with this incredible image that brings together the tail flukes and the dorsal fin of the killer whale and the skull of the whaler. It's phenomenal. So the whalers back in the day, they had to prepare they prepared their whole lives, in a sense, for, for whaling. Because it was not just an act of hunting, it was an entire connection to the cosmology, to the universe of the New Channels people. Um, and in order to succeed in catching a whale, um, you certainly had to prepare yourself spiritually and physically in different ways. Um, and you had to be even inherit the right to do such a thing, so it was something for high-ranking people to do. Um, other people speak about whaling in terms of how the whaler would communicate with the whale. When the whales were down in La Baja Peninsula of California, and the whalers would be here in New Channels territory, communicating with the whales and calling them to come up allow themselves to be caught. Here he's got a bit of a story, a kind of a song or poem, and he's combined this illustration from, it looks like from a Franz Boas book perhaps, a book about the ethnography of the Kwakwakiwak maybe, and he's incorporated this into a representation of a whale, a blowhole. It's a books for everybody bookmark. So I love how he's bringing together this new channel way of knowing the world with um, the, this kind of marker of Western knowledge, the bookmark. Of course, in Ron's house, these bookmarks are all over the place in his vast library and files and drawers and boxes. And here in the museum, they all become ordered, numbered, classified, <laughs> measured, and um, described in a way that maybe not isn't totally accurate. Lots of symbols of whaling coming together here with the prow of the canoe. 
the new channels, the new the stern and the harpoon head with its bone or antler barbs that were engraved with markings that would maybe increase their power or that would be specific to a whaler and the mast that represents a it looks like an undersea being maybe and then here we have a advertisement it looks like from some stores in Port Alberni maybe or Victoria and he's done a little drawing on it so it's almost hard to see there we have a whale hiding in the middle of all these buildings in this map of Nanaimo Some other odd ones here. A cutout whale. Again from a bookmark. And some just writing on them. Parts of stories. This is from a postcard of one of Ron's prints. So it was kind of by chance that we got what we got from Ron. Um, he made the selection. And he has many, many more at his house, I'm quite sure. We had an exhibition of his drawings quite a few years ago that were um, ephemera, so where he was, the, where he was drawing on the paper napkins and placemats and scraps and combined with his poetry. Uchanov art, Uchanov people that he's from, is, is not quite as well known on the coast and in the art market as as is art from the Haida and other northern people. Um, so that's another reason why it's really wonderful to have this kind of ephemera, these things not really, as Ron would say, not really answering the call of an outside world. These are things that he creates purely out of his own wish to do so for kind of an unspecified purpose. They don't answer a market need they're not directed toward an institution and it's pretty special that we now have some of these within an institution because they're not in a sense geared for that they're not meant for that um, so we're happy that ron was willing to contribute some here for the public to look at i think that there's a lot that we can look in read into these ourselves when we look at the patterns and maybe think of weaving and um, knotting and basketry and things like that. It just looks like that skeleton is alive the way it's looking over this edge here. Got a great imagination too. Ron, about his work, not calling it art, he says that he wants to make noise in the world. Make noise through various ways, whether it's drawing or singing or speaking or lecturing to people. Having his things enter the space of a museum. sat down with Ron trying to get him to explain some of these different ones, but I don't know that he really wanted to. <laughs> this one looks like more northern style whale. Quite Picasso surrealism. But this is a work by the contemporary Tlingit Aleut artist Nicholas Gallinin from Alaska. He lives in Sitka, Alaska. 
and it's called What Have We Become? Volume 5. It's a book work, as he calls it, because what it consists of is it's a sculpture that he has cut out of about a thousand pages of an ethnography about his people, the Tlingit people. Cut it into a self-portrait of himself. So this three-volume work um, by Frederica de Laguna, an anthropologist, um, which is called Under Mount St. Elias, and it's an ethnography of the Tlingit people. Um, it's one of the major works on the cultural history of Nicholas Gallinan's people. And he's asking through this work, you know, what have we become literally, like what, what is our source of information as Tlingit people to learn about ourselves? How has our sense of self been defined by representations created by others? How is, has our sense of self been mediated by texts, by museum exhibitions and that kind of thing? And so he literally cut a self-portrait out of that text um, using a blade and cutting each piece slightly bigger and so on to get his profile. He's done a series of these, not all of his own portraits, and some of them of animal portraits. But again, we were at the museum here, we were able to make a purchase of some contemporary works with our special funds. And I was really interested in work that um, would help the museum visitor to not only be looking at the other, in a sense, but to see something about themselves reflected within the work or to have kind of sparked in their heads some questions about what it is it when we look at things within the museum, what belongs to the museum or in a museum properly, um, what constitutes, for example, in this case, link at art. Um, what do we think Northwest Coast art is um, and what fits into that category? So those are similar questions to than what Nicholas is asking himself in this. So he's thinking, you know, how is it that our sense of ourselves as Tlingit people is defined by an ethnographic work that is so authoritative and that um, really becomes such an important source now for contemporary Tlingit people to learn about their history. Um, Nicholas speaks himself about having to go to museums to see anything of the cultural heritage of his people. So as an artist to learn about his art, he had to go to museum collections. He had to go to books. He had to look at illustrations and photographs. And um, increasingly now, um, you know, has been able to study hands-on pieces, like in our collection, he's come to study and really feel the carved work and really kind of absorb into his own body in a sense and the, the feeling the three-dimensionality of a piece and the ideas of it the philosophies of it so he's um you know and he's realized in his own experience that he has to use museums in that way and books in that way but he's going to question that as well and what that means for himself and for his own practice, for his understanding of what it means to be Tlingit. He's um, an artist who works in so-called traditional media and forms. He does, you know, he just finished carving a big totem pole. He does jewelry um, and other kinds of carvings. He's f fully fluent in working in a traditional Tlingit style of carving. Um, but he certainly doesn't want to be boxed into that in any way. And when he looks at the old Tlingit pieces that really inspire him, he sees in them how the artists of the past, like in the 1700s or 1800s, were also not boxed into 
a specific, you know, certain definition of what constitutes the limits of an art form. So it's not just a contemporary notion. Um, artists are off always exclaiming when we're working with artists here at the museum, looking at historical artworks. Um, they're always finding things where they're saying, hey, you know, what did that artist do? Like they, they just, they didn't, they broke the rules here. You know, and that was like in 1850. It's not like it's a modern thing to do. There were certainly rules and there were ways in which those old, old artworks, as we call them now, artworks, were functional things within those communities. So like a carved fish club or a hat or a robe, um, a mask, it would have a, specific function that it had to do so it couldn't you know go outside those kinds of functional parameters but within the specifics of the forms artists were absolutely innovative and playful and as new materials came into the society they used them they grabbed them um, as quickly as they could so all of these kinds of things are what I think of when I see a piece like this I see Nicholas because I know him <laughs> and it definitely looks like him um, in a ghost-like sort of way but I really love how he's um, used like he's literally carved the ethnography right he's carved the text to make make a work out of it and to sort of poke at some of our assumptions maybe of where authority lies and authenticity, um, what defines a certain kind of cultural art form. You know, he's kind of repatriating that knowledge in a sense into this artwork, repatriating the authority of the text into his own creation. <laughs> 